Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. Amen. to show for all ages to come 
through his goodness towards us in Christ Jesus, how infinitely rich he is in grace. Because it is by grace that you have been saved through faith, not by anything of your own, but by a gift from God. Not by anything that you have done, so that nobody can claim the credit. We are God's work of art, created in Christ Jesus to live the good life, as from the beginning he had meant us to live it. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. God loved the world so much, He gave us His only Son, that all who believe in Him might have eternal life. Glory and praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to John. Jesus said to Nicodemus, The Son of Man must be lifted up, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert, so that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. Yes, God loved the world so much that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not be lost, but may have eternal life. For God sent his Son into the world, not to condemn the world, but so that through him the world might be saved. No one who believes in him will be condemned, but whoever refuses to believe is condemned already, because he has refused to believe in the name of God's only Son. On these grounds is sentence pronounced, that the light, that though the light has come into the world, men have shown they prefer darkness to the light, because their deeds were evil. And indeed, everybody who does wrong hates the light and avoids it, for fear his actions should be exposed. But the man who lives by the truth comes out into the light so that it may be plainly seen that what he does is done in God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise Praise you, Lord Jesus Christ. St. John's Gospel is probably my favourite. I know I probably should be saying it's Mark. But um, I love John because he's so reflective, and but the problem with John's Gospel is that he's so dense, you can take out every sentence and uh, have a whole talk on, on each line virtually. So we obviously haven't got time to do that today. Let's firstly take up uh, Nicodemus. Who's Nicodemus? His name comes up, you know, from time to time, and uh, he is... He's a Pharisee, okay, so he's one of the upper class. He's a wealthy man, uh, probably aristocratic of that day. And he was also a disciple of Jesus. So, a Pharisee and a disciple of Jesus. Hmm. That's not what we normally expect, is it? No, see, not all the Pharisees were baddies. And Jesus would have actually agreed a lot with the Pharisees in terms of their teaching, but just not with their attitude and their falsehood, that kind of thing. That's why he says, you know, the Pharisees and the scribes occupy the chair of Moses. So you must listen to what they say, but don't be guided by what they do. But thankfully, there were good Pharisees around. Also, after 70 AD, as I've mentioned various times uh, over the years, that the Romans came and demolished the temple. So Judaism, Temple Judaism, as it was known in the time of Jesus, came to an end. They now no longer have a temple where they can offer sacrifice. 
But the only group to survive, you know how in the Gospels we have the Sadducees and the Pharisees and the scribes and, and the zealots and all of that. The only group that are, survives to this day of Jews are Pharisees. They were the most zealous for uh, upholding the, the, um, the law and, and the, the worship and so forth, even though there's no actual temple left to offer worship. So Nicodemus was a faithful Pharisee. He was actually one of the good guys in every respect. And he used to come to visit Jesus by night, not because there was anything wrong in what he was doing, but because he, was, he knew the popular opinion amongst the other Pharisees was against Jesus. And he didn't want to be tarred by the same brush. But at Jesus' death, when he's taken down from the cross, who is there? Nicodemus, a true friend, a friend in need is a friend indeed, and Joseph of Arimathea. Okay, so they're, they're good guys in, in several different respects. So he's trying to talk to Nicodemus, and we pick up the, in chapter 3, we part way through. He's trying to explain to Nicodemus how a man is born from above. And this being born from above, Nicodemus initially thinks, Jesus means literally, unless he's born again. He says, but how can a grown man be enter into his mother's womb again and be born again? It, it doesn't make sense. And Jesus doesn't come back and say, you silly goofball, you know. He actually says to him, and you, a teacher in Israel, you don't know these things. How, will I, how would you understand me when I explain to you real lofty spiritual things? Jesus was okay with Nicodemus not understanding everything from the beginning. So we actually enter into this conversation Jesus is having with Nicodemus. And now he is foretelling the crucifixion that would happen. Then Jesus says, you know, the Son of Man must be lifted up as Moses lifted up the serpent in the desert. Okay, now we've got to go on another little sidetrack to explain that image. This is a reference to what happens in the book of Numbers, where the Israelites are having a whinge session once again. It seems like that's all they did for 40 years, but I'm sure they did a lot of other things too, and not all of them negative. But as a result of the complaining against God and against Moses, God sends fiery serpents in their midst. And we actually have this reading as the first reading from the Feast of the Triumph of the Cross on the 14th of September. Anyone has their birthday on that day? No? Okay, fair enough. It would have been a great day to have your birthday on. Is that true? Excellent. Wonderful. That's Harry, isn't it? Excellent. Wonderful. Well, Harry's preparing to become a Catholic and to be baptized, so pray for Harry amongst the other children. Well, Harry, it's a great day to be born, mate. I'm jealous. I, so it's the feast day, or it's the first reading, and what happens there, the fiery serpents are giving death to many people in Israel. The people realize they had sinned, and so they go, oh, we've got the wrong thing, you know, they go to Moses, please intercede for us with God, because there's this plague now has broken out in our midst of these fiery serpents, and they're killing us all. We have no way of going out, of getting around it, surviving. God, Moses intervenes on behalf of the people. God is merciful because Moses is interceding and he says, okay, make a standard, make a serpent out of bronze and put it on a standard high up so people can see it. And anybody who is bitten by a serpent will look at, the, at this bronze serpent, will live. Now here we have an image of the crucifixion and what for us will become the new serpent will be the cross but i'm just jumping ahead what happened to the people <coughs> excuse me so they they get bitten one of them 500 a thousand of them get bitten by a serpent they look at the bronze serpent the serpent in the ancient world was a symbol of evil cunning uh, darkness but also of a whole lot of sin, particularly sexual sin, or sins against the sixth and ninth commandments. 
So it was symbolic of all of that. <coughs> so to be bitten by that, okay, the fiery serpents are going to bring you death. But now they have to look at the very instrument that brought them death in order to have life. And what's not written even in the book of Numbers is that by confronting the very object of your death, what's not said is that there's also an acknowledgement that we have seen, that the people had seen. And this is why the serpents were sent in our midst in the first place, because we were complaining against God and against his servant Moses. And then by admitting that we have sinned and confronting the symbol of the serpent, we then have life once again. We fast forward then to the New Testament, and Jesus says, just as the serpent was lifted up by Moses, so will the Son of Man be lifted up. But the Son of Man, here he's not referring to being lifted up on the, at the ascension or being glorified on Mount Tabor, but being lifted up upon the cross. This was what was going to bring about the Copernican revolution of Christian thinking. That the cross that was an instrument of death is in fact now, because of Christ's death and resurrection, the instrument of life. But it's one thing to say, it's another thing to actually wholeheartedly believe it. Who enjoys carrying their crosses? If you do, blessed are you. If you ask me an honest question, sometimes I don't mind carrying the cross. Do I like carrying it all the time? Absolutely not. Do I want to break from the cross? Yes. I'd love it if Sundays were off, for instance, and feast days were off, and Christmas Day, and all that. But no, unless you carry your cross every day and come after me, you cannot be my disciple. It's very, very strong teaching. It's like the teaching about forgiveness, uh, and, you know, forgiveness from your heart. These are non-negotiable teachings, and also the teaching on the Eucharist. So, the crucifixion, the cross, would become for us the freed, the symbol of life after Christ was in fact crucified upon the cross. And because the resurrection comes about only through the cross. Now, here we can go on a whole lot of explanation about the meaning of the cross, but in fact, the whole time of Lent, our Lenten penance, our reception of the sacrament of reconciliation, our extra prayer, our participating in the different Lenten groups, going to the stations of the cross, whatever else you are doing as part of your Lenten penance, what this is supposed to help you do, and me do, is to break from bad habits. The bad habits include all sorts of things, whatever our faults and defects are, we know them. But to help break from them by exercising greater self-control, self-mastery, <coughs> whether through denial of food in some way, or drink, or whatever it is that we've chosen to give up or to do. Acts of mercy to the poor and extra prayer. But in so doing, what we are in fact leading ourselves is in another direction, a direction opposite to sin, a direction where we are saying, Lord, I find this cross of yours rather difficult. I find it in fact unacceptable, but you don't exactly give me a choice about it. So if I'm going to follow your teachings and actually be a faithful disciple, then I must break with my bad habits. Now, if my bad habits were easy habits to break, do you think we need a, a season of Lent every year? Mm, no, we wouldn't. We wouldn't. One season would probably do it all. But the reality is that the deeper habits of our lives, whatever they are, we all know them, the things that strike us between the eyes, 
our selfishness, egoism, pride, whatever it is, those deeper habits are so deeply entrenched in our lives that if we didn't have a long period of time to actually look inside and see the many tentacles that are there, we would never have a hope of uprooting them. And so the crosses will come, but if we are making progress in this Lent, then little by little, and I do mean little by little, we will sense that we are more accepting of the cross. We are more accepting of those contradictions that come our way, those things that we don't plan for. If you gave me a choice as to what I would like for a cross, if God gave me a choice, because I'm not implying that you are crosses for me, right? Um, but if you gave me a choice, or God gave me a choice, then I would choose a cross that appeals to my, my stronger nature. You know, if I'm a crit cricketer, which I'm not, then I'd want to be tested, you know, in my, my good batting, because I know I could handle it. But typically, the crosses don't come where we are strong. In our, they come in our areas where we are most feeble. And that's why we get frustrated and angry sometimes, and we don't want to carry them. We drag them behind, as St. John of the Cross says, because we actually don't really want to carry the cross. But Jesus is saying to Nicodemus, Unless you learn the meaning of this, this rebirth, this spiritual rebirth that starts at baptism will not come about. And the good news and the bad news is this, that most people leave this earth without having undergone this transformation into the cross of Jesus Christ. The saints manage it, and they are our bar. And so, if we don't manage to undergo this transformation in the cross of Christ during our time on earth, when we can actually gain merit and glory in heaven by bearing our crosses with love and with patience, what do you think is going to happen after death? The work hasn't been fully done. What do you think is going to happen? Yeah, that's exactly it. We're going to end up in purgatory. And purgatory is a place of purification. And purification is not something pleasant. It's painful. It's fire. It's a fire of a spiritual form. It's something that will hurt. Why? Because it will be taking away from us those false attachments that we've had in life that we've never really wanted to work on. And in purgatory, we can no longer merit as a result of that suffering. Whereas on this earth, if we take up these opportunities, if we see these contradictions that come on our, our way on a daily basis, and try to receive them as best we can, it's never easy. But if we receive them as best we can, for love of Christ, with resignation, with understanding, then we will be transformed. And although we may not be fully there by the end of our lives, we will make a lot of progress. And then, if we do still need a bit of purgatory, it will be a lot shorter. So, what Jesus is talking about with Nicodemus is a very solid topic. And something really that's overarching. It's what we celebrate at every Mass. But that inner transformation is a constant, ongoing process. And we need to ask the Lord for the absolute grace of His to never let us flag in our zeal and in our desire to truly want to become better Christians. So that when we are heading in that right direction, then inconveniences, you know, discomforts here and there will be things that we just take in our strides. And that will be a sign that we are in fact making progress in our spiritual lives.
Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, God Almighty. From there, he will come to us the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting.
pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. We place before you with joy these offerings, which bring eternal remedy, O Lord, praying that we may both faithfully revere them and present them to you as is fitting for the salvation of all the world. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. The second son of preface of Lent and the second Eucharistic prayer. The Lord be with you. thanks that you have held us worthy to be in your presence 
and minister to you. Humbly we pray that, partaking of the body and blood of Christ, we may be gathered into one by the Holy Spirit. Remember, Lord, your Church, spread throughout the world, and bring her to the fullness of charity, together with Francis, our Pope, and Brian, our Bishop, and all the clergy. Remember also our brothers and sisters who have fallen asleep in the hope of the resurrection, and all who have died in your mercy. Welcome them into the light of your face. Have mercy on us all, we pray, that with the Blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with Blessed Joseph, her spouse, with the Blessed Apostles and all the saints who have pleased you throughout the ages, we may merit to be co-heirs to eternal life, and may praise and glorify you through your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, and with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, O glory and honour is yours, forever and ever. Amen. At the Saviour's command and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I give you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your Church, and graciously grant the peace and unity in accordance with your will, to live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let's offer each other a verbal sign of peace.
participating. For those participating from home, now is the time to make an act of spiritual communion.
always ponder what is worthy and pleasing to your majesty and love you <coughs> in all sincerity. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. First of all, at this coming week there are two big solemnities. Um, the Feast of St. Patrick on Wednesday and the Feast of St. Joseph, both solemnities. St. Patrick is our patron of feast in this parish, and, and so there will be a solemn mass on Wednesday evening, to which uh, I invite you to attend. Um, but that may not be possible for some, so uh, tomorrow morning, after the 9.30 mass at Port Kembla, there will be a morning tea in the hall, and the, you know, there will be some lovely songs, there will be tea provided uh, for a, a little donation. And uh, but also, please uh, feel free to bring a plate as well to, um, what's the word I'm looking for, to supplement the, uh, the probably generous amount of food already that, that's there. And the Vinis will also have a stall and uh, a chance to look at uh, maybe getting a bargain or two and support the Vinis and support the Catholic Women's League while we get together and have a, a lovely celebration for our patronal feast. Uh, in anticipation. Uh, there won't be one after the Mass on Wednesday, but anyway, you can't have it good all the time. Uh, so that's that one, one thing. Second one is uh, we're in the year of St. Joseph, as we know, and we're getting a section of the Pope's letter each week, and so we're celebrating the Feast of St. Joseph on Friday in a particular way. So after the morning Mass, there'll be a half an hour of Eucharistic adoration, where we'll just read a few of the passages from the Pope's letter to enter into it again, a deeper spirit of prayer and relationship with St. Joseph. Uh, for those who can't make the morning uh, Eucharistic adoration, the, uh, the half an hour of Eucharistic adoration also after the stations of the cross uh, in the evening. And uh, again, so something for everyone. I hope that as many of you as possible can come on both of these feasts. The members of the Pastoral Council, uh, please make sure you read that. The introduction and chapter one of the Divine Renovation books. I uh, will be discussing that uh, at the beginning of the meeting on when, on Thursday night, and the agendas will be sent out to you. And last but not least, uh, the Men Alive weekend. It's uh, still seems like a long way away, uh, three months, but believe me, it will be upon us before we know it. Uh, Men Alive is a wonderful way to engage men in parishes. Uh, someone uh, asked me before Mass, you know, why did you leave out Windang? Are we not welcome, the men here? And uh, I said, well, there's only one parish here, and it's the Port Kembla Parish. I know it sounds like uh, it's leaving, but Grimby and everyone is involved. It is welcome. But Windang, Grimby, Port Kembla, um, and then the two neighbouring parishes, canonically, so Warawa and Berkeley, and all the different towns that they operate. It'll be held in the hall, and uh, again, it's just really a day and a half retreat, a long day on Saturday, plus half a day on Sunday, and uh, I don't know what the cost is, but it's very affordable, and it's just a chance to really engage the men. So please start praying and thinking about who you could invite to come to that weekend. Plenty of learning. And if you know anyone looking for after-school care, there's some amazing uh, activities being planned uh, there by the after-school care at Port Kemba, the Aspire group. The Lord be with you. <laughs> Bow your heads for the blessing. Look upon those who call to you, O Lord, and sustain the weak. Give life by your unfailing light to those who walk in the shadow of death. And bring those rescued by your mercy from every evil to reach the highest good through Christ our Lord. Amen. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth, the Mass is ended. Amen. Amen.